How about now? There we go. Cool. Dude, again? Seriously? Here's the warning. Oh, wow. It, it catches it from all the way down there. That's pretty awesome. Uh, so I said I was going to do this live. I am not. I did not make the proper sacrifices. The gods were not appeased. So I'm going to do the same talk I normally do with this. I'm just not going to do any of the risky crap that would never, ever work in public. Wouldn't have worked anyway. So if you were here to watch me fail at a live demo, then I will not be hurt if you decide to leave. OK. Yeah, it, it, it's the truth, y'all. Yeah, so many, so many places are left to die here. So, how is everybody, how do you think? Thanks for staying to the end of the thing. It's uh, like Sunday is usually the, the, um, the day of nobody sticks around, uh, but I really appreciate you guys sticking around. And, uh, I, I kind of wish I wasn't at this point. <clears throat> You're an idiot. You should not choose me. No one should choose me over a pool party and or beer. So, speak. Mm. Mm. Okay. So, uh, just so you recognize, we are currently. Feeling, feeling through the reasons why I did, I'm not doing a live demo, because the network is not my friend. I definitely should have done this before. No, I'm good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, try, I'm gonna go to the, uh, to the other network, and we'll see how that looks works. Of course, as soon as I swap networks, it starts working correctly. Cancel. Cancel, dude. Sorry, I got to use hands. Actually, one of the, the, the yeah, one of those, uh, one of the, uh, what do you call it, uh, dock ones or whatever? Seriously? How do people actually live with these um, trackpads? And I watch people work with these things all the time. I, I cannot imagine anything worse than that. Yeah, the arc mouse, the arc mouse is good. Yeah, it is. Um, Got it. Sweet. Yeah, well, not, not, certainly not the uh, demo information, but the, at least the, here's my notes, and, um, and here's the counter, which is what I really care about. Okay. Ready, go. Uh, okay. Hi. My name is Michael Alvis. I am a software engineer. I am super old. I am not the oldest person in this building, but I am almost certainly one of the oldest people in this building, and I am almost certainly one of the people who has been here way, way longer than I should. So this 
it, this conversation is about a thing that I hold rather deeply. Oh, cool, it doesn't, it doesn't advance. How awesome is that, y'all? So, I am really, really fed up with non-determinism. I don't like things not to be predictable. I am really unhappy when stuff doesn't work the way I expect it to. And so I've spent most of the last 15 years not doing anything other than trying to make those things uh, predictable. So I only care about enterprises, so I am not particularly nice about how I say things, but I, if you don't make any money at what you do, then you're, you're vaguely uninteresting to me. And that's not because you're not interesting, it's because I have some specific needs. So my name is Michael Alvis. I work for a company called Array Consulting. I am Array Consulting. And I'm a consultant and DevOps coach. So what that means is I teach you how to be better at development and delivery. Uh, I ascribe to lawful evil. Uh, I have some neutral tendencies, which is to say I don't automatically like to do all the evil things. But I am very fixated on deterministic outcomes. Very, very fixated on them. And I'm probably not a shape-shifting lizard man, but if you get this thing and see that link, you'll figure out why I said that. And I am I, Michael Alvis basically everywhere. So the, um, most, most of the work that I do is in a regulated industry, which is why a lot of this is important. Now, <clears throat> I don't really think everybody in IT is a big crybaby. Not really. But it is certainly the case that some of them are. So you're probably a developer or an operations person or a tester or an analyst or a PM or something along those lines, and that's great. But you're pretty much all trying to do the same thing or have the same intent to get, the re get a result. And you write code or you deploy code or you talk about getting code or you insert features, something along those lines, and maybe you document that, but you probably don't. And maybe you realize how hard it is to do this kind of stuff with, uh, with, with or without you, but you probably don't. But process engineering is not a solved problem. We, it will never really be a solved problem. This is never going to go away. Nothing I do or you do or any of us do is going to solve this problem. All we can do is edge towards something a little more, um, a little more deterministic. And the nothing you do under the circumstances prevents you from doing good engineering except your kind of lackadaisical attitude and your in unwillingness to improve your skill. Nobody who is at this conference is unwilling to improve themselves. No, they're not. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have shown up. Nobody, I don't think anybody got forced to come here. And so you're, not, you're here because you want to learn some things, you want to interact with some people, but when you get back to whatever place it was you are, wherever you are, you're, you, might, you know that guy, that woman, that, that man, that person who just seems to be showing up. They're like, eh, it's good enough. Maybe you're the good enough person. That's okay, too. But you're, it's the skill and discipline are the two pieces of this that matter. And you cannot buy this. You can't buy it from me. You can't buy it from anybody that you know. You can't buy it from a vendor of any sort. It is almost impossible to buy discipline. It is almost impossible to. And even when you do, you're not getting the discipline that you thought you were or you wanted. So I do this thing in every presentation, and I, what it is is I'm going to tell you everything that I want to tell you in this conversation. And if you, you're like, oh, okay, this guy's an idiot, you can leave, that's totally okay. So my plan every time, every client, every team, for years and years, is to provide limited assurance. You say, I'm going to do these things, and I'm not going to do anything else. And they go, well, but we need you to do these other things. And you go, okay, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to promise you that I'm going to do these things, and I'm going to do those things. And if we have time or there's something later, yeah, maybe we'll do you another thing. Like, oh, those things are super important. And you're like, no. Mm. You know, I'll provide these things. These are the things I know I can provide. Those are the things you want. We'll see how that goes. You provide limited assurance. You make a relatively inoffensive architecture to provide that assurance. Something that doesn't look, something that's not clever. I am fed up to about there with clever in my life. I have a bunch of people who are super clever around me. And they're like, hey, we could do the thing with the thing and the pew, 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 pew. I'm like, yeah. Or we could write a service, one monolithic service that does the one thing that you actually need done, and then we could go on to the next thing. Yeah, but it's not cool. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I'm old. 
I, I like things to work. I don't like them to be cool. I'm not clever. I don't want to be. You apply process to get that. Process is how you run, your, run your, uh, the way through your life. And then you apply more testing to that process to make sure that your process is actually executing the process the way that you think it should. And you want immutable outcomes. If you do not do this, you are doomed to a certain sort of failure. Or at the very least, you're doomed to random success, which is, in my world, the same thing. You didn't fail. You just succeeded. You don't know why. Or you succeeded and you, don't, you can't prove why. Or you succeeded for a few minutes. And then everything went to the toilet and you're sad. And as I have said to many people from many, time, many times across my life, my default state is I want you to be happy. I do. I don't think about much of anybody but myself. But I want everybody to be happy unless I want you to be sad. And the only way I can think that I would want you to be sad is if you had done something to me. And, like, y'all aren't going to do anything to me any more than I'm going to do anything to you. So why don't, why don't we just try to all be happy under these circumstances? And in order to be happy, I believe it is damn near impossible to do that without having an immutable result. You want to deal with your dependencies. This seems, I don't know, implicit? Like, I, I'm, I don't know why I have to say this out loud, but apparently I have to say it to a lot of people a lot of times. You have to manage your dependencies. That's like, I, in my opinion, that is somewhere between 50 and 75% of a developer's job, is to manage dependencies. Your language may be good at it, it may be bad at it, but you, this is a thing you must do. If you do not do this, if you are not sure what the ingredients and what your software supply chain looks like, you are randomly succeeding. A lot of JavaScript seems to be randomly succeeding. And you definitely want continuous improvement. You want this process to continue to grow as it can. You want to use your immutable results from some, from some location, and you want to do that in order to get the, the kind of deterministic outcomes that you like. If, an, if a result is immutable and the storage is immutable, then when you did the thing and it was right and you go fetch it again, it still is right as it was before. And if some person changed that, well, that's one of those things that tends to make me want to make a person sad. And so I don't think that's necessary. I think that's actually the, the goal here is to get us to the place where we produce immutable outcomes in, a, in an unchanging repository, I basically a write-only repo. Now, how do you really do this? Well, this is where I tend to diverge from the way that most people in development do. I am very, very focused on a formal release process. You'll, there's a bunch of underlined words in here. These are the things that matter. I am, I use controlled source code. I know that sounds like a thing, but it isn't always a thing. If you're not using real source code management and, and a process for your source code flow, ye, you're back to almost random success. I use managed dependencies explicitly pinned to a version, not I need version one to version two. People do that. That's cool. Random success, people. You're randomly succeeding. I use versioned builds. Specifically, I use semantically versioned builds where the API is based on, the, the version number indicates an API compatibility. I test the crap out of it. And this is where it gets a little weird because testing the crap out of certain things is easy and testing the crap out of other things is darn near impossible. Uh, if you didn't go to Garrett's talk the other day about inspect, that's a way to test one piece of this. Um, there's a bunch of ways to test things, and I'm, I'm not here to tell you what those ways are. I'm telling you to do it. We continuously integrate these changes. The build, every build really needs to be tested, obviously, but every commit could technically be built. And therefore, if you're going to test every build and build every commit, you're testing every commit. And if you don't, well, that's okay. But when you make a commit and the tests fail, you kind of need to go fix that. And we produce immutable artifacts out of that that we keep forever, where forever is defined as whatever your data retention policy is. You might, yours is probably forever, it could be forever. Depending on where I'm working, it's either 30 days, three months, or, or 10 years, uh, whatever. So there's a way. You write your code, you unit test it, you identify it with a version. The namespace and the version of a thing is the primary identifier of that thing that you're gonna build. You note that, that, that 
uh, for an identification. When you do a build, you're going to release. You're going to tag that release. You're going to make a tag out of the thing. You're going to check out the tag and make the artifact from the checkout. Why do you do that? Well, because source code management, especially if it's done by you, can totally fuck up that tag. So you want to know that the tag is right. So if you said the tag indicates the, the thing that I'm releasing, and I said I tagged this code and then I built this code, well, no, you really didn't. You didn't build that tag. You built this code. Well, the tags are the same. I'm like, really? Okay. Really? All right. You're wrong. You're, you're, you're trivially, provably wrong because... Frequently, what has happened is there's things you're not committing to source code that are like part of your part, your little private world. It's a build on my machine's problem. So I ought to be able to build that tag the same way you build that tag, or at least in the world where there's configuration of build capabilities, I ought to be able to do it, I think. You save the artifact. The thing you built from that tag gets stuck somewhere forever. This is having a, uh, having a caching, proxying, artifact repository is just, well, that's just, make, that's just good sense. Now, a lot, of, a lot of languages have a little trouble with that, especially languages that happen to use source code control as their dependency managers. A couple of those come to mind. I hate that with burning passion of a thousand suns, but I'm not the person that makes that decision. You're probably not the person that makes the decision to use that language, and that's not my problem. But no matter what the problem is, you got to figure out a way to manage those dependencies and save those artifacts. You use the artifact, never the source. Once you've produced a release, you stop talking about the source. That was just how you got here, and this is where we are. The contents of that artifact repository that you put your immutable artifact in are the thing. There is no other thing. The source code is crap. It's lies. For, all, for practical purposes, who cares? It, it might as well be, just like it, it might as well be that, that X that you hate. We repeat this process until we die or get fired or go to a new job, or make a different one, or you come to me and you're like, hey, here's why you're categorically wrong. I would like for you to change your process. And I'd be like, huh, turns out you're right. I'm going to change it, because that's what continuous improvement's like. So I'm going to define some of these things. An artifact is a thingy. I know that seems really, uh, seems very, uh, uh, very technical. It's a thingy. It's a collection of bytes that has a name. And it's a bucket of stuff that has some identifier attached to it. A platform, for me, is a, is a place you want to, some artifact to be available to a consumer. That's where you want it. You want it to go somewhere. An environment is some pr precisely configured platform. Now, these are, these are the way, this is the way I talk. If, I, if you're like, hey, I need you to come fix my problem because we have these huge problems, I will talk in these terms, and I will not talk in your terms. These are the terms that I will talk in because these are probably more precise than your terms and they map to things that I can back up every single time. So you got an environment that's a precisely configured, like, like prod. Your prod environment is a configured platform, but it's a specific configured platform that probably looks a bit like your test platform, which is probably configured slightly differently. Availability means that you, that you can be, the thing can be accessible to your consumer. A version is an identifying signature of an artifact. Now, I say version, like version is not just a number. It's the namespace around it with the number. But the version number is also very important. Build means to produce a potential artifact. And release means to build an immutable version of an artifact. And deployment is the, is the act of inducing availability into an environment. I, may, I deployed a thing, that's an action. Deploy is an action, it's not a noun. I deploy a thing, I don't have a deploy. I, and it's a production of availability. So the pedantic view of this is that everything in your life has a process, literally everything. You, you have an order that you take, do things in, you might swap that order around, but you, you, gotta, you have a process that you, take, that, every, that you flow through across the course of a day, and all the flows change over time. So you've got to be willing to do uh, continuous updates on this. And jobs, that's your job, the thing you do, that is just an execution of the flows that you get paid to execute. So when we talk about this, we use the process to increase more of the pieces of the outputs that we want, more of the illities. Repeatability, reliability, verifiability, observability, ability, 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 ability. 
So when you say that there's a, just because there's a fixed process for a thing, that doesn't mean you're always going to execute it that way at every time. You can fail. You can do it wrong. Right? So nobody's like, nobody's got a gun to your head that says you got a fixed process. If you, if you step wrong, you die. Nobody does that. Well, I hope nobody does that. If you do that, I know a grief counselor. So, but you've got this, you've got a situation that says you can fail at this. If you don't, well, I mean, you know. Anyway, chaos is always around you. The, per, the your missteps, the sun, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, solar flares and, and dying systems and failed hard drives and all these things. These are all parts of the failure possibilities. Chaos is everywhere. It's not your friend, but it isn't also isn't necessarily your enemy because sometimes failures tell you things that, you, that successes couldn't. And so it shows you the edges of your system. First of all, if you fail, you now know where there's an edge. Maybe you didn't even know that. If you've never failed at releasing a piece of software, which... <laughs> That's hilarious. But anyway, if you've never failed at that, then maybe you don't know what it's like, what a, what a failed release looks like. It's, that's a binary state arrangement. There's some success criteria. You either did it or you didn't. And if you've never not done it, you don't know, really know what those criteria are. So I have a word that I use a lot in this talk, and it's called determinism. Um, so there's a couple of them in Webster's belief of all events caused by, basically, there's a kind of determinism that says you are not in control of your life. You have no control over your life. This, that everything is predetermined. That's a weird kind of determinism to me. That's like a kind of a funky one. But then there's other one that says that acts of will, that the acts of the will, occurrences in nature, social or psychological phenomena are causally determined by preceding events. Or what I like to say frequently is, today is the result of all your yesterdays. Present you is the, is the net log, uh, journaling log of past you. Yes, sir. Exactly. Exactly that. You got here by screwing up, hopefully. Hopefully you screwed up some. Because that's, that is the primary learning mechanisms we have, is making mistakes and the pain that comes along with that. But you're a journaling log that is rolled up to present you. I will very frequently say the phrase, future you hates present you. Because you are stealing things from future you all the time. Every time you do something that isn't exactly right, usually it's the way you, st you did it was you stole from future you. You said, hmm, I don't have to run this test. Oh, well, yeah, Jason's got a big cup of ice cream or something. Is that what that is? Yeah, that's stealing from future you. That's like, mm, present me thinks this ice cream would be awesome. Future me is like, why the hell did I eat this? Yeah, I say that a lot, actually. So, big deal. So, your stuff is probably pretty complicated and probably pretty airplane. It probably has more steps than it should. It's probably very difficult to replicate. Is that the case for anybody in here? Anybody have a rough process? Something that stings a bit? You're like, shit, dude, I don't want to do this. Anybody don't? Anybody's life, they just go, my process is badass. Like, yeah, I'm going to stand up here and be like, man, that thing, when it fails, it fails gracefully, and we can just keep doing it. Well, you've got one, but you probably have the others that are screwy, too, so don't, you know, don't try that. Don't try that crap with me. Oh, you got one. Shoot, that was actually, a, you were actually asked, oh, tell me, tell me, tell me. Mm-hmm. Right? And there's something here that's an XOR that I have configured. I, I can always get it to configure if it's actually in an SS kernel. I flip the script. I run the exact same script. You're running dash T in the SSH call? No. Terminal emulation? Ask that guy right there. Seriously, he might know. This is my problem with Oh, okay. Yeah, that can be that can be challenging, certainly. Right. 
So you got this thing, like Jason, you got this human-centric situation where it's like, I can't do this with a tool because, because chaos injects itself in the middle of this nonsense. He even knows what this chaos generation engine is, and he doesn't know how to tame it. We've t- we had a bunch of talks this week about, uh, about slaying dragons and how things, how things go sideways and that sort of stuff. Yeah, welcome to software, people. You, know, the, you can have the most perfect process, and it still can, can die on you. Yes, sir? Okay. Yeah, true. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, you absolutely build the, the checks that say the thing did what I thought it would. So determinism, is, determinism as I'm talking about it now, is not uh, is not perfect determinism at any point. It's determinism at a moment, right? The deterministic outcome of that build, like for instance, spinning up a server in AWS is, ha- takes time. If you go, take an AMI, so you have, even if you had a perfect AMI that was small and spun up, there's a time frame associated with that. Most tools, most good tools, goodish tools, when you use those tools to do that, they, have a, they take that into account. And they use Amazon's um, uh, logarithmically increasing timeout periods for checking to see, you know, like wait 10 seconds, wait 30 seconds, wait 150 seconds, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it isn't, determinism isn't immediate, and it is, but it isn't, um, and it isn't necessarily bounded by your desire. It's a result at some time, not at the time you thought it was. More specifically, if you do have a time, fl- time limit or a time frame, then it's easy. 15 minutes from now, if this thing's not done, it's never going to be done, and you just destroy it. That's the math. I, I, want it, I need this within 10 seconds. Ooh, damn, y'all. You get, man, that's going to be fun. Let's see how that goes. But just because the thing that you want is deterministically possible doesn't mean that the criteria for your deterministic need is going to be met. And so you just have to know what that means for yourself. So, it is frequently we have these things that are human centric, but I, I have this this statement that I cannot believe any other way in an, in an enterprise certainly, but in almost all cases, your only job. You had one job, Fred. You had one job. Your only job is to deliver the value that you have promised to your customer. Nothing else matters. Literally nothing else matters. Determinism or happiness or your, your, your pulse, none of those things matter. Jason. <laughs> People. Hmm. Then it's not done. Sure. Delivery, right? So a few minutes ago, I, I had some defined words that I said that, that what that meant, right? So when you say done, what you mean is available. Is it available? Well, what does available mean? Well, go, go look at Michael's slide that asks what available means. That means it's been, it's been induced to be accessible by somebody. And you're like, oh, it's not available? You're not done. So mapping, your, mapping terms to precision, maybe you want to use a different term. That's cool. Don't care. You might use the term done, and that's, that's good, but you need very precise definitions for what those are, because if you don't, you really don't have determinism. Determinism is itself dependent on precise definition of success and failure criteria every time. But I can say this one without regard. This is what you're here for. I don't care if you, are in, if you are in software at any point, any point of the delivery chain, that's what your job is. You're a developer. Oh, my, I develop features. No, you don't. You deliver value to the customer. I'm in operations. I make the developer's code uh, run. No, you deliver value to the customer. I'm a project manager. Nope, you deliver value to the customer. Well, how am I supposed to deliver value to the customer? I'm like, oh, you don't have any part of that? Well, you're like what we call redundant. 
if you're not delivering value to the customer, why are we, why are you, why are you even here? Who are you? I believe, I believe we mean to make a call to HR. So having the capacity to do this, right, is a team effort. It's a devops -y kind of like huggy, feely crap. But ultimately, you got a process, you're going to do it, but it's probably dumb. Your process is probably dumb. Anybody think their process is dumb? Anybody? Not everybody. Oh, okay. Some of them are. Sure. Well, all of them are dumb. All software is broken. We're terrible human beings. We really just don't belong here. But given my, my parents, like, did not have me killed as a child, so I think I should probably at least honor their choice. So we have dumb processes. We do dumb things, and we do that stuff. But we are really good at iterating on those things. We suck at everything. I have the privilege, burden, of knowing a bunch of professional magicians. And they will tell you, people suck. They are terrible at everything. You can make a thing go from left to right, and they'll just be like, what? They can't see. They can't hear. They can't remember. Hell, they can barely remember. Who remembers what they had for breakfast four days ago? I know what I did, because I didn't eat anything four days ago. But... You know, you don't remember a bunch of stuff because it doesn't matter. But you can't see when the three-card money is going because that's the whole point. But you've got this, you're terrible at everything except getting better at everything. That's like, I mean, that's what growing up is about. So what you want is you want to play video games all day. That's what I want. I want to be able to play video games all day. All day long. I even said this to my CEO. I said, Doug, I want to play video games all day. He's like, why would I pay you to play video games all day? I'm like, well, if I could play video games all day, technically speaking, everything's great. And he goes, yeah, but why would I pay you? And I'm like, mm, how do you think they got that way? So that's what I want. I want to play video games all day. And I only want to be bothered with anything if there's something that's actually wrong. And under those circumstances, I think that's pretty reasonable. I want automated stuff. I want my deployments automated, I want my bills automated, I want my testing automated, and I don't see a reason, I have yet to find a reason, no compelling reasons, that I cannot stomp on the ground and destroy for not doing that. And it's too hard. Oh, remember discipline and skill from the beginning of the talk? You get enough of that, it's not that hard anymore. Who here knows how much of their code is actually tested? Ballpark it. Zero. Okay, that's knowing, right? You know the number is zero. Great. But these two folks seem to think, and is it zero? Okay, okay, so zero. All right, so you're in the zero group. That's not the same thing. That's like cheating. Okay, but some, sometimes you know, right? You know. I kind of know, right? But if your process says, well, if you don't know, and more importantly, when you know, if it's not enough, fail. And you go, but, but we got to get stuff in production. I'm like, well, you better get your damn tests up, brother. You know? You, you, I'm, I'm looking for some continuous improvement in your life. You're the developer, you, or you're the tester, or you're the DevOps nerd, or whatever you are, and you're going to keep producing increased and better outcomes. Or I'm going to know why. And that is the part where we go back to that place where I said, my default feeling is that I want you to be happy. But if I want you to be sad, I can assure you I know how to make people sad. I'm, like, super good at it. And so if you're going to show up and be like, I don't really give a shit about this testing stuff. I'm like, oh, man, me either. Oh, no, I totally do. Could you, like, move along, please? You're going to want to update a LinkedIn profile or something like that. That thing matters. I want automated maintenance of those deployments. I, want them, I, want, I kinda want them to be self-healing. That's a little harder. But honestly, it's just one level up of deterministic. It just stays the way I want it to be. It stays the way it's working. Now, I want documentation. I wanna know that you know and that you are able to tell me what success looks like, what the criteria is really gonna be. I want reliability in that system. 
in the delivery system. I want to be able to rely on you because I want to, wait for it, play video games all day. And so under the circumstances, if it's not repeatable and reliable, I'm not going to be able to play video games today, and that's going to make it so that I need to make you sad. And so I don't want to do that. I, want it, I just want it to work, and I want other people to be able to think that it works too. In my business, in my business for years now, auditability is just key. And the coolest thing about all of this is if you have automated deployments, automated builds, automated releases, automated testing, you also get outputs from all those things that are typically very consistent and incredibly auditable. Like, what is your, what, well, what's your deployment look at? Well, it looks like that Terraform script right there. It's like, well, about what is that? I'm like, it's that Terraform script right there. What are your, well, how do you know that your security rules are being enforced? Well, that's that big pile of inspect tests right there. Bah, bah, sorcery. You get some, you get, you get some old school, crusty, you know, 10,000 year old security wonk who's like, bah, sorcery, burn the witch. And you're like, dude, come on. This is, I'm trying to help you here. I got a test, and it says a thing, and you're like, you can read it. You're like, no, you have to have the checklist and the Excel file. And I'm like, why don't you set yourself on fire? And he goes, because I'm in charge of you. And I'm like, oh, really? Oh, um, do I have a say in that? No. Hmm. Do you have a boss? We can talk about this. Let's talk about whether your way is better than my way. Whether I can produce auditability, you can't. You're a liar. You have a drug habit. You're a drunk. You're careless. You have dyslexia. You, you transpose the words true and refrigerator. I don't know. Whatever it is. You're human. My machine, man, that thing runs like a machine. And that machine produces reliable, auditable output. So... We're frequently desperately seeking these. I think I should probably put that in some sort of online profile or whatever. But the point is, is that we want predictable. Deterministic in our case means predictable. I'm going to do a thing, and the expected output is this thing, and if it isn't that thing, then it's like, well, something's wrong. If it's not predictable, then the delta state is something's wrong. So the other part is that, well, OK, yeah, anyway, that's how I'm using it. Predictable means reasonably predictable, too. That's not, like, I, I'm gonna, this is going to sound kind of funny coming from me for people who know me, but you don't have to be an asshole about it. You don't have to. You can be like, well, it failed this time. It's like, oh, well, what happened? Well, I'm not really sure. I'm like, okay. You can't blame people for failure. That just makes them hide stuff. Um, if, you don't, uh, if you don't know that, then you should read a couple of books about blameless blamelessness and blameless cultures, those are real. You know, me, blaming a person for a thing doesn't help you at all. Resolve the thing and make it so it's harder to do the problem, do the wrong thing next time. That is way better. My way is just better than yours. If you were into blame, if you want to, if, if you have a CEO comes down and pounds tables and asks whose head needs to roll, my way is better. My way is psychologically, testably, provably better than firing somebody because they made a mistake. If you're firing somebody because they make, the make a mistake person, I think you're an asshole. And I'm perfectly happy to tell you that to your face. I, don't, I, I can get another job, comma, asshole. Totally. If you are the sort of person who places blame, it's somebody's fault. Of course it is. They did something. Did you think they were trying to bring the company down? Maybe you're the asshole. It's ridiculous. Nobody comes to work every day and goes, today, IBM stock goes into the toilet. Nobody does that. Why would they do that? There's, no, there's practically no, oh, that, shoot, there's a lot of value in that in there. Hmm. I might have to change this talk. But there are constraints on reasonability, and those constraints ought to be, or uh, predictability, and those constraints ought to be very reasonable. Yes, sir. Uh, on, yes, <laughs> maybe, if I can remember it, it's red. Oh, <laughs> there you go, that's it. Also, uh, The Field Guide to Understanding Human Error, if you have not read this book, you should read that book. Uh, Dr. Sidney Decker is a genius. He studies airplane crashes. 
And if you don't think airplane crashes have the same kinds of behaviors that software failures do, well, then you should probably read that book. And you will come away from it going, huh, bad deploys are like airplane crashes with fewer dead people, hopefully. Um, so reasonably predictable is pretty darn good. But actual determinism is impossible. Yes, sir? Yeah, well, we, or or at least you don't build um, at least you don't build premium baby monitors. So there's that, right? So how do we do this? We're trying to solve an impossible problem and produce an impossible result with with deficient tools and an often unreasonable standard. And you approach it. Well, I use source code control to handle everything. I treat everything like it was a build problem, and the build fails if it is not right. Now, you may not do that. You may not want to do that. You may not want to shove everything to the left that far. I have a 1,000 batting record on this. I've literally never failed when I did this. Not ever. I am 42, I'm 42 years into my career. I've been doing this since I was 10 years old. And every time I do that, I have had a full, unqualified, unequivocal success. So who in here can say they batted 1,000 at anything? You batted 1,000 at not having tests. Congratulations, way to go. But every time I do this, it works the way you expect it to. Now granted, I'm changing the rules every single time, right? I'm, my rules are, the way that I know it works is I looked at the output and it's the output I expected. And you're like, well, what if you just expected crappy output? And then I'm like, if I got it, I succeeded. If your expectations are low and you get low outcomes, ta-da, you succeeded. Does anybody know when this is supposed to be over? Is it now? Okay. Is that after? I was like, I'm hoping, I'm hoping I'm not eating three minutes of somebody's time at this point. If you know how many slides were left in this deck, you would be worried about that. So I go to source control. I use it, and if you do not, I, I'm not going to call you an asshole, but at least you're a fool. You need to do, learn to do merges properly. If you don't know how to do merges properly, that's, and you're a software engineer of any sort, including the kind that writes um, infrastructure as code, you, you, have a new, you have a new homework task. Yes, sir? You don't know how to do merges properly, Jason? Everybody say goodbye to Jason because I'm killing him after all this. <laughs> you establish yourself a good workflow, and the tool you use is way less important than the workflow you use. Subversion is a perfectly valid source code control system. RCS is a perfectly valid but super crappy source code control system. CVS is a great pharmacy and a perfectly valid and not so terrible but not that great source code control system. Pardon? Fossil's great. Yeah. Like what you love. <laughs> Fossil's a great source code control system. Git is a, it's a great, it is now. But it hasn't been great for the whole time everybody said it was so flipping great. The tooling sucked for years. Who thought that? Anybody thought that didn't, wasn't true? Anybody was like, I started using Git the day that Linux put it out and it's been awesome since then. Well, you're a liar. It sucked for years. You're a liar or stupid, or delusional, or, or shut up. So you want immutability. Source code control can help you with immutability. But what we're going to do is we're going to say that there are a lot of ways to handle that, and some of them are better than others. And for variance is on the word better, and your mileage may vary on all of that. But immutable outcomes stored in a place that you can fetch them by some identifier that is consistent, about a 1,000 on I never fail. Never. And can I fail at that? Yes. I could stop doing all the kind of national socialistic crazy stuff that I do to people under those circumstances. Like the part where I go, I am never deleting an item from this repository once it gets in there through the release process. And they're like, well, what if it's wrong? And I said, then give me another one. But what if it's got passwords in it? And I go, you should go change those right now because it's not coming out. Ever. Not ever. Pardon? We'll let you do what? 
Well, you can do all kinds of ways to erase them from GitHub. I'm talking about an artifact repository. Source code control is a, is a calculated lie. Who here has written his, rewritten history in a source code system? Who is not? That's what I thought. You can do it in almost any source code manager. You can, it's, kind of, it's actually harder to rewrite history in Subversion, but you could totally do it. Totally. So the source code control is a calculated lie. Your artifact, your outcome, the place you put that, that thing needs to be immutable. There are a couple of these. There are actually a double handful of them. There are two. There's Artifactory and, and Nexus. And then there's all the rest of the trash. Gem in a box, that's a real one. It's trash. Go get, a, go, go get a real one that lets you decide whether it's possible to override an artifact. That's like got a little click box and you say, allows redeploy, and you go, nope. And then when you write one, you'll never write it again because that thing will be like, nope. You know, it's backed by source code, or by, by storage and a database and all that stuff, sure. If you have the keys to the kingdom and the capacity to do so, you could certainly go remove it. Don't do that. So tags are a pretty easy way to talk about things. Um, they're volatile in Git and Mercurial, but not necessarily so much in Subversion. Um, they let you talk about specific points in time. And they, people who don't talk, tag their code need a firm talking to, in my opinion, especially if you've decided you made a release. Maybe your release is the tag. Maybe there's no artifact. There's an artifact. But maybe there's not. There is. But at the very least, make a tag, people. So you got containers. Anybody here like living in the 21st century and actually use containers at some part of their life ever? So I have a lot of feels about those things. I, uh, I like them. In the beginning, I, I hated them immediately after. I liked them again, and then I hated them again. And then, and now I'm just like, now I'm all confused, and I'm wondering if maybe I'm just like, a, I'm just, like I just don't know. But the truth is, pardon? Yeah, it's like love. <laughs> or hate, which is the same thing. <laughs> so containers are this really cool artifact. You build a container. The output of that is an artifact. Who here recognizes that their container registry is their artifact repository for their containers? Everybody. I don't care if you didn't. Now you do. So you do. That's the thing. It's, that's what that is. Um, they're easily deployed, and they're OK to figure, and they are a giant pain in the butt to maintain. And if you think that's not true, well, I pity you at certain levels. Who here actually just takes their containers from their developers and runs what's given to them? That's what I thought. Stop that crap if that's what you do. If you were just too embarrassed to say that, which you totally should be, stop that shit right now. You go build that thing yourself. Ah, the, the, the developer already did that. Who here knows a developer who has ever told a falsehood to them ever? I have. I, I have lied, straight up lied to my operations people. Been like, no, I totally ran those times. So yeah, you got to get you got to get to the place where you can sub assert things about this. Deterministic outcomes are the things you assert about your situation. Um, they are getting better. Everybody knows this. It's not news. Um, Kubernetes won the container orchestration wars. If you aren't aware of that, it's done. It's over. The conversations were past. We're going on the next conversation. Um, if you're in a brownfield arrangement. Managing a deployment can be kind of challenging. It's getting a lot better. Um, and then there's external management systems that you occasionally have to deal with. You might have heard of this thing that Amazon does called AWS. That's uh, just an external platform you got to deal with. Sometimes it changes. Who here used to use Google Reader? Who doesn't now? Who uses Google Reader now? Why is that? Because Google does not love you. But their, their cloud platform is pretty damn good and they don't just snatch stuff away from it. So there's things you can use under these circumstances. CloudFormation is a great tool. Terraform is a great tool. Uh, these are like marriage, though. You, they tend to be, once you start using CloudFormation, you don't, you don't get away from it too hard. It's, like a, it's a little bit like you start getting legally bound to them. You could also do your own. This is what I did. And 
It always works for you. You can guarantee it because you just changed the criteria for success. Remember, I, didn't, I, I succeed 100% of the time by changing the definition of success. And now, it's like marriage except for this one thing. You are married to a monster. Never do this. Do not, under any circumstances, start building an external management system for your artifact man, if you're, for your artifact deploys. Please don't do that. And I, do, I write a bunch of tools for building things like images and containers and packages of stuff. That's a little different. It's not exactly different because it's a monster. And once a human being uses it, they now own your time a little bit. And if that human being is you, you've got nobody to blame. So you don't want the responsibility or the authority, and the business always wants the accountability, and so you take it away and you give it to a robot. Who here has an automated release cycle where they can say, I want you, Mr. Robot, Mr. Roboto, Domo Arigato, I want you to release this hash of this source code repository. Who has that? One, two, three, four. Does it work every time the same way every time? Well, then you don't. If the answer is no, you don't. If, it, if the variances are things like, whoopsie, you know, you had a developer that ho ho hosed something up, yeah, that's different. I'm talking about under the, the happy path is not the same every time, then you really don't have that. You got something close, and it's better than nothing, but, man, once I had that, see above Enri, I about 1,000 on that. Because I just say, hey, you're going to run the, the release process is going to be fed through that robot. No, you can't touch it while it's running. If it fails, what well, you failed. Figure out why it failed. Well, you should probably do that differently then. Yeah, you can submit it again. Yeah, absolutely. I'll help you with that. But you're going to do it the way the robot wants it. And the robot can't be ultimately flexible. Who here has more than one build workflow for in the same team. You have a team, they build like 11 things, and they have like three build tools for the same type of thing. In a room this size with this many people, the answer is always at least one. Why? Oh, the developers want to do that. Well, who cares what they want? Their job is to deliver value to the customer. That's their whole job, and the best way to do that is kind of conformity. Oh, well, their tool is a little better for them. Like, I don't really care that much. So when you hand responsibility over it to, the, to a critter, you get to, say, you get to just pass that off. Oh, the lease process just told you no. Sorry, bro. Just didn't work. Man, that's sad. So sad. So they get developed like code, just like anything else. So remember, your robot is basically the same as the rest of your code. Now, stagnation is not what immutability means. It's just repeatable over time, and the results are always acquirable in the, from the past into the future. You gotta make it stable, and if it needs to change, you gotta replace it, but you replace it with a version of the thing, the next version of the thing. So, as you replace old versions, you do it with a new version, and you use semantic versions because you're not an animal, and the namespaces work as a view into the functionality, so if I know that semantic version works, and I know you're replacing 1.02 with 1.03, I know I can just do that because everything that depended on 1.02 is, by, uh, by definition of the version, binary compatible. So, give yourself a good fallback, too, by the way. 